Hello, everybody, and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mike's, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com. You can find cool stuff in stock every day and check out our co-sponsor CardHoarder.com, offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. And check out our altar sleeve. Support the show by using the code Magic Mike's at checkout for 5% off anything in the store, including a set of sleeves featuring the Magic Mike's crew at altersleeves.com slash Magic Mike's. And finally, our newest sponsor, Cardamajigs, has an upcoming Kickstarter for Cardamajig Season 2, or Series 2, rather. Cardamon Jigs are reusable booster packs for Magic Cube and more. Sign up for the Kickstarter launch notification at cubeks.com. I am Evan Irwin, and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Aaron Campbell. Hi, how are you? Ruben Bressler. Hey, how's it going? Welcome to the dungeon. To the dungeon. Ooh, no, actually, I didn't bring this up, it. but I did actually get in the Cuba Jigs Series oh. 2 stuff right off, oh, the, cool. right off the production line. Okay. We got some of those. And nice. so uh, this one's not open. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me show you one of screwed There's up. a couple do, do that I was interested in. I think there was a demon version that you have to unlock, maybe. Oh, there's all kinds really of stuff. Cool. Like, here's a different one that looks really cool. Nice. Which wow. I like a lot. And these are. These are good, great for cubes, but yeah, can yeah. also be used for like um, jumpstart, right? Oh, perfectly. Yep. Yeah, they would be one hundred percent perfect for jumpstart. So uh, these are now. If you've ever had the cube magic stuff before, these are actually glued on the sides. So Ooh. they are they are together in that way. So you can okay. see here. Nice. Yeah, they're kind of machined uh, together, yeah. which is which is good cool. Quality. So before, like okay. the whole thing spread out. Now you just have to have your top and your bottom loader, so the cards never get damaged, and on we go. Yeah, well done. And we'll talk about more of these as I get them open and I'll awkwardly destroy boxes. And we'll talk yeah, more about top and bottom loaders on the pre-show. <laughs> That's what we do here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we also begin with our choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call Honorable Mention, where Ruben will tell us who was the most eloquent in letting us know what card we did not choose is one of our retro top 10 Battle for Zendikar and Oath of the Gatewatch cards. Ruben? Well, our top comment that I chose for this one is from Helena Real or Helena Real, uh, who writes, Out of all the horror you summoned back with your words, there's one that's sorely missing. The only white Eldrazi, the terror of many formats in combo decks of various denominations, and one of the weirdest of the new breed Eldrazi Displacer is, for me, the unsung monstrosity of this block. I hate that card. It's a hell of a card. I'll be honest. I kind of expected this on Ruben's list. I was like, well, that card's dumb and did a lot of work in tournaments, so I don't know. Eldrazi Displacer is a white and two generic mana for a 3-3 rare Eldrazi with Devoid. It has no color because that's dumb. Two generic mana and a wing dang. So that's a colorless and two generic mana. Three total. Exile target, an exile another target creature. Then return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control. So you had a bunch of mana, particularly some colorless mana. You can start blinking things all over the place. Not itself, but everything else. And that is inherently powerful with anything with the come into play ability, which is like, I don't know, 90% of creatures these days. Yep. It's also mm -hmm. good in combat. It makes combat a nightmare. If you happen to be playing a token strategy, those those tokens aren't coming back. Mm -hmm. um, there's also some combos with Containment Priest where they will blink your thing and then Containment Priest says you didn't pay for it. And so it stays that way. And right. um, I've seen shenanigans with Thought Not Seer and that. And just it's just a, a card that did not need to exist. And worst comes to worst, you can just tap down your opponent's creatures. I mean, that's that's also a fine thing to just pump in there. And oh, by the way, it's three, three for three, which it's, is all you know, just good size. It's very, very rare to see this type of effect be able to target your opponent's creatures, mm -hmm. let alone over and over and over again. Yeah, no tap. That's a colon. Yeah, yeah, that is a colon. I don't cards whatever. Either way, <laughs> it is real and it was a thing, and I don't have super great memories of it, but it was powerful. Congratulations to uh Helena Real, Helena Helena Real. Give yep. us give us the the four hundred one on that. Spice on it. There we go. Helena, <laughs> please contact <laughs> us on social media for your prize. Don't question it. Thanks again yeah, to CoolStuffInc.com for sponsoring yeah. this giveaway. That's right. And stay tuned for our top ten list week uh, list this week, and maybe you can win next week's free gift certificate. You're going to feel real dumb when she's like a 50-year-old nun and she's like, hello, I am Helena Real. <laughs> Can you tell I just got out of Black Widow? I'm sorry. You spice it. <laughs> Let's do this. That's crazy. All right. Well, now we get to talk about our the D&D &D set. The D&D &D set that's totally not M22. It's not M22, y'all. It's not a core set. 
They filed it off. D and D set. They, yeah, they filed the registration <laughs> numbers off of it. I like it. Yeah, I mean, it's not a core set in terms of complexity. There's a lot happening. Like dungeons are pretty. There's a ton of choices. There's choices. Everything is like a mini Titan and a mini Saga. Like everything has, you know, but the, all the things that they do are very low impact, low power level. Right. Right. You're scrying one. You're gaining one life. You're making right. a goblin token. But in terms of power level, absolutely. This is core set power level. Uh, at, well, you know, there just became a point where, you know, I was playing the limited format and I'm like, this is core set limited. Incredibly, yeah. you know, sort of aggro based in many ways. It's very momentum based. It's very swingy. And. After a while, I also realized that I don't care if they venture into the dungeon. It doesn't really matter. You're going to scry one. Oh, God, don't scry one on me. Like, it's yeah. whatever. It's fine. It's fine. But we're here to talk about our top 10 cards from that set. So let's get started with our number 10 here. Ruben, what's your number 10? My number 10 is... I mean, there's tons of indelible characters and tons of, of famous um, beings from all over the Forgotten Realms. But for me... I was super excited that they not only imported this very famous, hilarious, interesting character, but also added a creature type that we hadn't seen in Magic yet before in Xanathar Guild Kingpin. Oh, yeah. Four generic mana and a blue and a black gets you a 5-6 legendary creature beholder. <laughs> At the beginning of your upkeep, choose target opponent. Until end of turn, that player can't cast spells you may look at the top card of their library at any time. You may play the top card of their library and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast spells this way. This uh, cascades out of control, by the way. It's like playing Experimental Frenzy where you go land, spell, 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 have to stop when they have a land and then your opponent's drawing a land. So, oh. and it's also a five, six. Cause you keep going. So it's, as long it's a as you big want. creature. I didn't even think that you keep going. I thought it was yeah. like, you get one. I nope. didn't know. You just Whoa. play the top of their library. Yeah. You go spell, land, spell, spell, Jeez. finally hit a second land and then you're done. But it's like experimental frenzy, except for then your opponent's drawing a land off the top of their deck. This card is crazy. Oh, this card is Very nice. cool. Yeah. It, it has interesting combos with, um, paradox haze, uh, there's a Sphinx that gives you an extra upkeep for things oh. like in Commander. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and it's it's also just a big body. I mean, 5-6 is, is, is no joke. Yeah, 6 mm. mana, 5-6, the monster, a legendary Beholder, which is great. Like, we wanted Beholders. When we heard yes. there's a D&D set, you better have Beholders in it. And by God, we got some good ones, and this is a legendary one. So I thought they were going to give us Levitate as a keyword. Um, which would have been like, can only be blocked by creatures with flying and reach and cannot block creatures with flying, like sort of in between hmm. flying. You know what I mean? Like it can but they gave us over, fly, right? So. But they gave us fly. They gave us a bunch of like generic other one stuff. Or one and th you didn't have enough room in the text box for uh, for Xanathar. There's still a lot of words in there. A ton of words it does on a lot. Xanathar. Does Super a cool. Book. So much that Aaron wasn't 100% sure what it was doing. I mean, now that I right. know, I would build this. This card's yes. awesome. Sweet. This card's yeah. great. Aaron, what's number 10? I'm not made of wood, people. Uh -oh. I'm not made of wood. I, I had to do it. I, I, I hope to God I never have to cast the spell because there's no way I will ever be able to do this in any sort of mature fashion. My number 10 is Portable Hole! Oh, my yeah. God. Portable Hole. Uh, portable Hole is one colorless. It's an artifact. When Portable Hole and. <laughs> I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Port when Portable Hole enters the battlefield. Is that what it does? <laughs> exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls with mana value two or less until leaves the battlefield. Um, and so, yeah, I hope to God I never have to cast this. Um, it's funny because I tweeted something to that effect. And then somebody from the Dredge Discord goes, uh, Aaron, we're, we're testing this in modern Dredge. And I'm like, oh, no, no, don't. I'm just going to have to like quietly just. So you're telling me you got to <laughs> sleeve up some portable holes? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> but no, this card actually does seem like it has potential. I mean, it's one mana. Artifact decks are going to love this. Um, I, you know, I just recently built Osgear in Commander, which I really enjoy. I've also had Shroom for a while. You know, Artifact being a very viable, you know, card type. Um, Exile target non-land permanent. That's anything except for lands with two or less. That's great. Um, usually when you see things like two or three or less, it's usually a dog whistle for older formats. Um, I, I like this. I think it has potential. Yeah. Uh, see, I like I mean, foils. It gets, therefore, it gets I, like, in peace. I like shiny portable holes. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I do like a hole of potential. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Sorry, Ruben, you were making actual <laughs> discussion. No, you're good. I listen. Far be it from me to uh, put a stop to the whole discussion. <laughs> Oh, the whole discussion, ladies and gentlemen. This conversation sprung a hole and Ruben plunked it. You remember in the pre-show we were talking about how mature our podcast is? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're grown adults, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Okay, for my number 10 here, this was a card that does something very unique. It, it also, like, it's so it spurs me into, like, I want to build a deck around it. The other half is I definitely want to learn about what in the world this creature is and what it does, because this is clearly the legendary Mind Flayer, which is Grazalax Illithid Scholar. It's two blue and a generic mana for a 3-2 rare legendary horror. So three mana for a 3-2 that whenever a creature you control becomes blocked, you may return it to its owner's hand. And whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, you draw a card. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, giving blue, um, you know, bounce, bringing bounce back to blue is really cool, especially being able to kind of, um, a creature you control, um, being able to, um, bounce defensively, where right. if you go to just sort of turn them sideways and something happens that you don't expect, um, that's really cool. Um, obviously it's got a neat way for you to draw a card and mind flayer is another popular creature type from D and D that in my opinion, if you're going to do in D and D set, you've got to have mind flayers. Like, yeah. You just have to. Grazothrax is a named character from the Neverwinter game, mm. uh, Neverwinter Nights, and is also appears in some Drid's Duerden uh, novels. Um, apparently, uh, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and Grazlax helped Drist and the rest of the heroes of the Hall to defeat the Demogorgon, I believe, in one of their adventures. Nice. Um, but uh, yeah, the other thing I remember about Grazlax is that uh, Grazlax had a deal with a lich, to where the lich wanted the souls and would like throw the bodies away. And then Grazalax was like, I'll just, I'll just have those, I guess. And then would eat their brains, which is great. Lich, please. All right. So lich, please. <laughs> let's move on here to number nine. Ruben, what's number nine? My number nine. I mean, everything's adorable in this set. Everything's hilarious in this set. And this one appeared early and uh, is also a defender. And so it's going to go right into my Arcades deck. My number nine is Flumpf. Oh, my oh, goodness. Yeah. Flumpf. Colorless and a white for an 04 jellyfish with defender and flying. Whenever Flumpf is dealt damage, you and target opponent each draw a card. Flumps are adorable little jellyfish monsters. Well, not even little. They're humanoid. Um, they're like as wide as your shoulders, although they're kind of small, I guess. Um, kind of flat looking. They're, yeah, they're like they're like big pizzas that float around with streamers hanging off of them. And they just hang out in the Underdark and they've got very complicated flump societies. And they have they're very smart and they're very wise and they're very good. Um, and seeing one is like a good omen in the Underdark. And it just makes me happy. I'm, the thing I like about this is flying in Defender is really good, so it's bound to block something. Four, it's got a nice butt on it, and uh, it's dealt damage. It doesn't specifically say combat damage, so if you do have any ways to sort of just do one damage to everything, or if you have a way to ping it, you can just sort of trigger it whenever you want it. Um, the only downside, I guess you could say, is that you know your opponent has to draw a card as well. Um, I'm the kind of commander player that doesn't want to give you anything, so that's a bit of a turn off for me. But um, I have seen some positive feedback to this. I have seen people excited to play it, and it's a uh, it's adorable. I love the little eyes. Like just, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah this to me is uh, well first of all i played this in limited there's there's a certain blue white sort of venture deck that wants yeah. to go very slow and venture in the dungeon a whole bunch and you mm -hmm. just want to just like stop don't attack me and hurt me just let me go venturing for a while and so being able to draw cards and stall people out is kind of cool and interesting and neat this is also like a three dollar rare because card draw in white is very yeah. rare yeah um and this also allows a lot of politicking you're able to say well you know i'll give you the card this time as long right. as we're cool. And then next your time. opponent has like a like a Raghavan or a Magda commander and you're like, hey, we could both draw some cards if mm. you're interested in just attacking me. That's right. Yeah. Or like if you attack me, I'm going to let them draw a card, you jerk. Yeah, I, I could see this being good in limited. It kind of reminds me of our preview card when we had Nessie and Boar, and people were like, "Ew, your opponent's drawing cards," and it's like, "Yeah, but these are limited cards, like right. you know." And so, if you're confident that what they're drawing is just not very good, you don't care. Let them have the card. You get a card too. Yeah, I mean, I had like two blue dragons or whatever in my deck, and I'm like, "I'm gonna get to them eventually, and then they're <laughs> going to kill you." So let's yeah. draw some cards. It's fun. All right, uh, Aaron, what's number nine? 
Uh, my number nine is a really exciting card. It deals with a creature type I feel like we haven't seen too much in Magic Magic's history. Um, it also has the ability to uh, do very well in an aristocrat style deck, or um, I think you can just sort of play Magic and this works well too. Uh, my number nine is Skeletal Swarming. Um, so Skeletal Swarming is three colorless, a black and a green. It's an enchantment. Each skeleton you control, skeleton, what? Mm -hmm. Has trample. <laughs> Sure. attacks each combat if able and gets plus X plus O where X is the number of other skeletons you control. Mm -hmm. I think of skeletons, I think of like one ones. Like I don't think of skeletons as like, you know, this marauding horde coming at you with trample and huge power. Um, and then if you're wondering like, well, what if I don't have any skeletons or what if I run out of skeletons? It's got you. At the beginning of your end step, create a tapped one one black skeleton creature token. If a creature died this turn and it doesn't say a non-token creature, so just if a creature died this turn um, and it doesn't have to be one of your creatures either. Uh, create two of those tokens instead. So this essentially fuels itself. And I don't know about you, but I absolutely want an army of skeletons. Like, that sounds dope. Yeah. This card is really powerful and limited. I lost this sure thing. Is. I underestimated it. And before you know it, they had like four, four ones or whatever. <laughs> and it was gross. And I died a lot. So. I love it. This thing, this thing is Assemble the Legion, right? This yeah. is the big five mana literally make a bunch of tokens an and army. crunch you i mean each individual skeleton may only do a little bit of chip damage to you but even the wiliest adventurers as long as the tidal wave of skeletons keep coming yeah you're gonna die eventually because uh it's this is the this is the capstone rare for the bl the black green morbid strategy oh yeah um and yeah this card's this card's quite good oh this card is it was just absolutely bananas and the fact that you know whether your stuff dies or their stuff dies if you're trying to chump block, even if their stuff lives, they're still getting extra skeletons, which are pumping the other skeletons are out, and they have trample, so they're like, holy cow. Like, this is a card good enough to where I would at least maybe try to build a deck or two around it in the standard 2022 environment, because it, it creeps up on you really quickly. Um, and having two of these out, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds horrific and awesome, and that's why I want to test it. Uh, so for my number nine here, uh, this is a card that got a little bit of buzz when it first came out, mainly because we're just, we're just, you know, getting used to the dungeon thing now. We're starting to understand how good a venture in a dungeon is, how much we want to do it, when does it get like sort of overpower, or at least when does it start feeling more powerful than the average bear? And certainly more than the average titan, you would hope that Nadar, selfless paladin, would be able to come in in a pinch and help you figure out if these dungeons are worth playing or not. For a white and two generic mana, it's a three three rare legendary dragon knight with vigilance and whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks you venture into the dungeon meaning you enter the first room or advance to the next room and other creatures you control get plus one plus one as long as you've completed a dungeon so that plus one plus one that's some serious boostage right there and it's not doesn't take too long to get down to the lost mine of fandelver and yep. finish that one up dragon knight yeah card's cool yeah uh, I actually don't know this character um, really from from D and D lore, um, but you know, dragonborn are are a uh, are a pretty common race in mm -hmm. the Forgotten Realms. Um, yeah, being able to pick and choose which version of the dungeon you want to try to come. I mean, we've got the three dungeons, right? right. We've got the aggro dungeon in Tomb of Tomb of Annihilation. Right. We've got the control dungeon with Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Right. And then there's like the go-to mid-range kind of dungeon, yeah. which is the Lost Mine of Fandelver. Right. That's the one I usually default to because I'm, you know, either I need an extra land, so I need to scry, it seems to or I just default. don't know what else I need to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Nadar, I mean, 3-3 three, three for 3, that tr this thing will trigger 2-3-4 times mm -hmm. most of the time in Limited. Now, remind me, you can't play more than one dungeon, right? Correct. You at have a to time. You can one. only be in one dungeon at a time. But you, So you could have all three, and then once you've worked your way, you can start another one? You once you've completed the same one a dungeon, oh. yeah, you, once you've completed a dungeon, you can actually choose which dungeon you want to go into right. next. Even the same cool. one. Yeah. Okay. Right. Good to know. Which is how that Acerarak Aluren combo works. Oh, yeah. Is that you can just complete the, the Lost Mine of Fandelver over and over again. Um, or the whichever the one is, is the one that drains your opponent for one life. Gross. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The um, and, and, you know, this is one of those cards that in limited, very, very strong. Um, I kill this thing in the instant I see it because, <laughs> you know, going to the dungeon once, whatever, maybe even twice. OK, but this thing's going to trigger it a whole bunch and the stats yeah. are good and then it pumps their whole team and you want to get rid of this guy as soon as possible. Triggering the dungeon once is like scrying. Yeah, it's like not it's, very good. Yeah. 
how anything that triggers more than once, even like the Delver's torch, is super good. Right. Yeah. Um, just because it starts cascading, cascading, cascading. Yeah. So let's move on here to number eight. Ruben, what's number eight? This is the only higher that I have on somebody else's list. Well, okay then. Aaron, what's number eight? Uh, this set has a lot of neat toys for Liesa. I've been thinking about building a Liesa Shroud of Dusk deck, and uh, this is a card that I could see fitting in very nicely there, along with any deck commander deck that just needs card draw. Uh, my number eight is Eye of Vecna. Um, Eye of Vecna is two colorless. It's a legendary artifact. When Eye of Vecna enters the battlefield, you draw a card and lose two life for two mana. I will take that every time. Um, and at the beginning of your upkeep, you can pay two colorless. If you do, you draw a card and you lose two life. This is good card draw for every single color. I know white specifically struggles with card draw. Red has some very strange options. Option. Options. <laughs> Not as strange as how I pronounce that, but just as strange. Um, and uh, yeah, I like this. I think this has a lot of potential, especially if you are doing any sort of life loss shenanigans, life gain shenanigans. Um, yeah, I think this is great. And it's an artifact. What? Oh, yeah. This yeah. is a card that I played against multiple times in Limited Wear. I think it looks a lot better than it plays in limited, particularly because limited format is very sort of shaky and you can lose an advantage and suddenly this thing does absolutely nothing for four turns and you and you die. Um, but in constructed, this is like a sick sideboard card. This is the number one thing I'm bringing in with my mono red deck against a control deck. I'll pay life all day long so I can draw more <laughs> cards. This is fantastic. Yeah. Yep. And the fact that it replaces itself immediately is super impressive. Yes. I mean, we don't we usually see, you know, this kind of effect on things that trigger during your upkeep. So you have to like wait a whole turn. The fact that this replaces itself immediately and then can draw a card the next time you untap is huge. Yeah. Um, you know, burying people under card advantage is a tried and true uh, uh, strategy. And this is Maze Mind Tome for, you know, the new world. And I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed by this card. Art's really good too. Oh yeah. I am, I am here for it, as they say. Well, <laughs> for, uh, for my number eight here, now Lord knows Wizards has learned a lot from Dragon's Maze. Um, there was a maze in it, but there were no dragons in it. So when they made the Dungeons and Dragons set, they made dungeons and they also made dragons. They made yep. a bunch of dragons. They made a whole cycle of like uncommon dragons, but they also did a cycle of mythic dragons. And let me tell you a little bit about Icing Death, Frost Tyrant. This card is dope. It's two white, two generic mana for a 4-3 mythic legendary dragon with flying and vigilance. And when it dies, you create Icing Death, Frost Tongue, a legendary white equipment artifact fact token with quote equipped creature gets plus two plus oh and quote whenever equipped creature attacks tap target creature defending player controls and equip wow. for two generic mana jeez this card yeah. is a lot it's a whole bunch of words card is a lot but it's very i powerful. was hoping that the the sword because the sword icing death mm -hmm. is the famous one it's one of the two blades that drizz duerden wields it Ooh. and twinkle I know Twinkle is the other sword, but <laughs> you, you have the sword of fire and you have the sword of ice uh -huh. and icing death is the ice sword. And it is an iconic image to see the blue sword and the red sword in Drid's hands and to have icing death die and make like a plus two plus O equipment is kind of boring. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, the, the fight between icing death and Drizzt and the rest of the heroes, um, was an epic story moment in the R.A. Salvatore novels. And, uh, I'm, I'm super excited that all of these chromatic dragons have gotten their day in the sun. It definitely feels like they pushed this one to be very like, you know, four mana, four power, flying and vigilance. It's got evasion. It's making something when it dies. So it's always relevant. So you can play extra copies of it later if you draw those, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and, you know, ironically, you can equip it with its own tongue, I guess. Sure. <laughs> which I'll take as well, which is yeah. kind of cool. But yeah, the, the, the whole Mythic Dragon cycle is neat. Um, and I definitely love them. And this is sort of the first one that I can talk about now. So, all right, let's move on here to number seven. Ruben, what's number seven? All right, I got a lot of words to say because oh, this boy. card has a lot of words on it. Um, so we're rolling D20s now in Magic, mm -hmm. which I'm still on the fence about. Uh, uh, I really like playing blue-red roll dice in Limited. Uh, it remains to be seen if any of these cards are going to see play in Constructed, but uh, 
I mean, the one that is the most flavorful, and I think might have been the first one we saw, is Treasure Chest. Yeah. And I've gotten the chance to play with Treasure Chest a couple of times, and it's been good! Mm. It's been a good card! Um, Treasure Chest is three generic mana for an artifact. It's a rare. You pay four mana and sacrifice it and roll a d20. On a one, it's trapped, and you lose three life. Well, I haven't, I haven't had the pleasure of having a trapped Treasure Chest just yet. On a 2 through 9, you make 5 treasure tokens. On a 10 through 19, you gain 3 life and draw 3 cards. And on a natural 20, you search your library for a card. If it's an artifact, you may put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, put that card into your hand, then shuffle. Um, for the most part, I've been getting 10 through 19. Uh, you know, And that's 7 mana to gain 3 life and draw 3 cards, which is fine. Like it's in fine. limited, that's really good. Oh yeah. Um, you know, five treasure tokens is no joke. Also, you can use those treasures in a variety of different ways in this limited format. And oh, by the way, you can search your library for some big giant animal in your deck or some crazy artifact. One of the uh, larger vintage streamers, uh, Justin Gennari, uh, just recently posted a deck where he was trying to turn this into Tinker in vintage, and he was running four copies of this along with Tinker. Um, and he finally rolled a 20 uh, with the bullet citadel in his hand and so he was like just just rip (laughs) um but yeah i mean there's definitely something here um and uh yeah i've heard nothing bad about this it looks fun it it was a lot better than i gave it credit for like when i read this one for the first time i was like this card looks terrible seven (laughs) mana to do what but it you know when you break it up over two turns when it always feels like like the bad option is that you got more mana back than you put into it which is the the five treasure tokens uh it always felt you know basically again it felt kind of bad if they got anything other than one in limited so in constructed maybe you could get there who knows yeah. so it's a little silly but i like it uh let's see here aaron what's number seven my number seven is the only higher on my list uh-huh my higher ain't for a minute so y'all ain't gonna hear about that for a while <laughs> I get to talk about my number seven. It's great. Got to talk a little bit about it and a pre-show. If you happen to be a patron, patreon.com slash magic mics. Um, so my number seven is cool. This is one of those, this is one of those cards that it was a new card type. It was different. It was strange. Is this going to work? Is this going to make things happen? Well, I've had a lot of fun with Bard class. Bard class is red and a green mana for an enchantment class. One of those new things that say gain the next level as a sorcery to add to its ability. The default ability is legendary creatures you control enter the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on them. For a red and a green colon, you make it level two, which also includes legendary spells you cast cost a red and green less to cast. This effect reduces only the amount of colored mana you pay. And for a red and green and three generic mana, so five mana total, you get to level three, which is whenever you cast a legendary spell, exile the top two cards of your library. You may play them this turn. And so when you have cards like Galea of the Endless Stance, when you have cards like Targnar, when you're able to play cards like Grum Gully for one mana, Clothis for one mana, Rada for one mana, it gets really, really ridiculous. I this is one of those cards that I didn't really believe it until I kind of got to play with it a little bit. And we'll talk about some other classes later and whatnot, but this one really snuck up on me and it could be real, at least for a little while. I really yeah. like the classes. Like that there is yeah. a couple of these that I would absolutely play on Commander. Yeah, yeah, I abs- I love the classes. I think that these were really well done. The design of having it be like a photo negative of a saga. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is level up done correctly, mm-hmm. which, you know, I liked level up as a concept, but it never really looked good. It never really panned out. On creatures. That was the problem. It was on creatures. This, it just grocks. This right. just makes sense. And Bard class in particular, you can get off to some nutty starts. You could empty your hand like you're playing with Burning Tree Emissaries with Bard class. Yeah, I mean, it gets, not, you know, when you start with just spare a Sentinel, and then on turn two, you activate the class, you're able to play Magda, and then use Magda and with Jasper mm-hmm. Sentinel, do stuff like, it gets really silly, really fast, I assure you, and I've done nothing but play with this card a little bit ever since, and I've been very excited about it. Uh, Questing Beast is still a legendary card, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. So I'll pay three mana for it. And then late game, you can turn it into a card advantage engine. Like if your opponent plays a bunch of Wraths and you're Mm -hmm. like, well, still had all these Gallias that are going to exile the top two cards of my library and I can play them. Yeah, for free. It's it's still for free. Oh, I did that. And I was like, wow, that felt amazing. You just put it on the table and cards just pop up to play. And that is fantastic. All right, let's move on here to number six. Ruben, what's number six? My number six, I considered putting at my number eight. Because she's the Spider Queen. 
Um, but I decided that she was better than that. And mm. she might have a uh, room in constructed, although I haven't seen any decks with Lolth the Spider Queen as of yet. Yeah. Three colorless black black gets you a four loyalty legendary planeswalker Lolth. Whenever a creature you control dies, put a loyalty counter on Lolth. Pay zero colon, draw, you draw a card and lose a life. Minus three, make two, two, one black spider creature tokens with menace and reach. And minus eight, you get an emblem with whenever an opponent is dealt combat damage by one or more creatures you control. If that player lost less than eight life this turn, they lose life equal to the difference. This hmm. seems like a control finisher. Hmm. Um, seems like a very easy kind of, you know, zero mana draw like every turn, even at the cost of a life. For five mana, usually those planeswalkers or those those effects are six and seven, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there's room for this card. And oh, by the way, two two ones, the turn that it comes into play is no joke. Yeah, I got a chance to play with this in limited. Got to pick this, pick one, pack one. Uh, it was my first seven two draft that I got to draft. It was red black sacrifice, which obviously goes very well when you're sacrificing creatures to put loyalty counters on this thing, making the two ones which are great. Zero colon, just drawing cards. You know, planeswalkers and limited are ridiculous, uh, but planeswalkers and constructed. Hey, this is a card advantage en engine. This yeah. is what I want for a blue black control deck. Yeah, yeah. A couple things stand out about this card. Uh, obviously, the first one. Can I just be her? Like, can I yeah. be her when I grow up? That's that's gold right there. She's uh, um, she is gold. She is gold. She is. Uh, you know, the, the the queen of deceit, shadows, and spiders, Jeez. complicated webs of schemes and things. I, I feel you. Same. Yeah. Um, I also noticed that the spiders in this set are aggressive. When we think of spiders, typically we think of big butts, small power, big toughness. These are the opposite. This is 2-1. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a black common or uncommon that also, when you deal damage, makes 2-1s as well. So, yes. Yeah, so yeah, that's I'm the thing that stands out to me is the spiders are very aggressive in this set. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're coming to get you. It's it's yeah. a in general. I've seen spiders be quite aggressive. So, I, but they still yeah. got the butts, though. You know? It's true, right? Except when they're I mean, grand. You do have the legs, card so. Wild Shape that lets you turn one of your creatures into a one five with reach. Yeah. So you've still got those green big butt spiders, and I've also seen some spiders that want to hide. You know, but in general, Lolth is the queen of much more aggressive spiders. Yep. There you go. Um, the the green spell uh, turns them into one fives. So they'll turn them into one threes. Am I wrong on that? So it can. So wild shape can turn it into a one three with hex proof, a three three with trample, or a one five with reach. Aha! Uh -huh. There you because go. Because that's wild shape. That's how druids work. That's that's just how it works. It, it's a wild. It's a wild shape. Everybody. <laughs> and you are totally correct. I was incorrect. All right, Aaron, what's number six? Uh, so my number six is a card I'm so excited about. I haven't played a lot of D&D, &D, but I used to read the books for fun. Um, and this was a, a creature or a character that I absolutely remembered. Um, and it's so flavorful. And to me, it does this card absolute justice. Uh, my number six is Gelatinous Cube. Um, so Gelatinous Cube is two colorless and two black. It's a creature type ooze uh, with four power and three toughness and engulf. When Gelatinous Cube enters the battlefield, exile target non-ooze creature and opponent controls until gelatinous cube leaves the battlefield uh, but what if it does leave the battlefield they're going to get their creature back right oh no um, it also has dissolve for x and a black um, you can put the creature that with mana value x exile with gelatinous cube into its owner's graveyard which is exactly what they do um, they consume you and then they dissolve you and then they might like spit out your bones or something and so this is so cool I love that it's got a decent power and toughness decently costed um, it's a new kind of like a ravenous chupacabra but you don't have to worry about indestructible or anything like that and you don't have to worry about them actually getting the card back kill it i dare you i'll eat it i love it so much yeah the ability yeah. to dissolve it at instant speed is great so good. it's not quite the ravenous chupacabra oh no every card is bad you can say well if you got removal you can get it back yeah you, you can save it maybe <laughs> i was a little sad that this was not a four four because it's a cube mm. oh okay but sure but power you know level reasons. That's probably power say. level. Exactly. <laughs> power level reasons. I'm okay with it not. And yeah, you, you, as a DM, when you spring a gelatinous cube on new players for the first time, uh, that's a hug from Jesus. When, <laughs> when, because it, when you're going through a dungeon and then you describe the dungeon as being just a little bit too clean, like there's no dust on the ground and all of the experienced players go, Oh no. And then all the new <laughs> players go, what? What is that? What's the problem? It's a clean dungeon. Walk forward directly into Gelatinous Cube, <laughs> which is always a fun time. Nice. That is fantastic. And again, you know, this is, I like the idea of there being in the standard environment kind of a four mana creature that answers 
creatures, I guess, as it yeah. were. Um, and this is a good job of it. Again, you know, indestructible is a hard thing to work around, and this is a nice way around that. Yeah, as it's, well. it's a good faceless butcher yeah. kind of thing. I'll take it. Uh, for my number six here, this was this is a weird card, and from what I can tell, it is actually seeing some play, which is great because it's one of those cards. I mean, look, man been here a long time i've seen a lot of cards come and go i've seen a lot of hype come and go i've seen people excited about stuff myself included ended up being terrible and so i'm a little more guarded these days all right a little more guarded and so i mentioned on twitter i'm like look this card looks great maybe it's great i don't know and so you know some people online are just like really like isn't this like obviously great you know how many obviously great cards i've seen be absolutely nothing burgers mm -hmm. in magic yeah. it's ridiculous but maybe in the Phoenix deck, the Demolich, or I think it's Demolich, right? Demolich, Demi yeah. Demolich is going to get there. Demolich yep. is blue, 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 blue. That's four blue mana symbols for a 4-3 Mythic Skeleton Wizard. This spell costs one blue less to cast for each instant and sorcery spell you've cast this turn. Whenever Demolich attacks, exile up to one target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard. Copy it. You may cast the copy. You may cast Demolich from your graveyard by exiling four instant and or sorcery cards from your graveyard in addition to paying its other costs. That's a lot of words. This was my number seven. Uh, nice. This is one of those cards that I took a look at and I was like, there's something here. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, it has graveyard, which of course I like. Um, it has a way to reduce pips, which is like, what? Like huge. normally when you get cost reduction, it's usually in the form of colorless mana, but you can erase the pips like my God, um, decent power and toughness for three, um, you know, copying something from your graveyard and instant sorcery, getting it back from your graveyard. I've seen a lot of hype around this card. Um, I've seen vintage doomsdays players be excited about this doomsday players. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's not hard to chain that many spells together and just get a free four three. And so I'm really excited to see if this lives up the hype and just really, really creepy art. Um, I, I just love everything about this and i just i want it to be good yes i love it it's a little yeah. horrifying it's i mean demi liches are extremely horrifying yeah. so the way a demi so demi liches are effectively happen when the lich lets go of its earthly form the lich eventually will be like i don't need this flesh these bones anymore i'll just be a floating skull and that's what a demi lich is. I mean, a lot of demi liches, a lot of liches try to avoid that, um, and are like, I'd rather maintain, you know, some semblance of myself. But the transformation into a demi lich, you also lose a lot of yourself. You sort of become a malevolent force of, you know, without your memories and without your um, previous connections. But you just maintain focused, concentrated necromantic power. And they are absolutely terrifying. Like, if you are a lich and you're like, mm, I need more power, being a demi lich is for you. Yeah, they're absolutely terrifying. Yeah, demi lich, please. All right. Well, there you go. Oh, man. Let's move on here to our number five. Ruben, what's number five? My number five is a card that I have had a little bit of pleasure playing with in standard already. And I gotta say, is maybe the best creature land I've played with. It is very, I mean, I don't, I don't know why it snuck up on me, but Lair of the Hydra mm. has been spectacular. Um, Lair of the Hydra is among the new rare land cycle. Mm -hmm. um, it is the green one. If you control two or more other lands, Lair of the Hydra enters the battlefield tapped. It taps for a green and has the activated ability of X and a green colon. Until end of turn, Lair of the Hydra becomes an XX green Hydra creature. It's still a land and X can't be zero. The fact that you can, you know, use this early if you really want to and attack with a 2-2, two, two, a 3-3, three, three, whatever. But late game, when you've got just extra treasures laying around, you've got, you know, a bunch of extra lands, your opponent's wrath to your board, here comes an 8-8. Eight, eight. Here comes a 10-10. Ten, ten. Yeah. Card's insane. But and there is some removal out there that does specifically say non-land. I know Abrupt yeah. Decay is one of those that you sometimes have to remind yourself of, where you're like, oh, right. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, Raising that, Borrower that is, in Standard? That is very relevant, yeah. Yeah, this is a... Um, and this is also one of the cards they did the special treatment for. They look like the old monster manuals and whatnot. Um, that's also, like, one of the first things I bought of the new set on Arena. I'm like, I want the sweet treatments. 
I'm not going to bother looking at them in, on sale or whatever. Yep. I'm, just, I'm just getting them because I love them and they're great. Um, this card has been absolutely fantastic. I've played the Mono Green deck in Standard 2022, and this is a four of as it should be because it's fantastic. The the little clause there to say that you know you get it comes to play untapped on your first couple turns is huge because that means huge. it just doesn't doesn't suck. It never sucks. It's either it's great early, it's great late, and that makes a great Magic card. And that's what it is. All right, Aaron, what's number five? My number five may not look like much, um, but it is, is exactly what my Pashalik Mons Commander deck ordered. Uh, my Pashalik Mons deck is Goblin Aristocrats. I don't really want to attack. And that's very difficult because a lot of goblins are out there that are meant for attacking. You have your lords, you have your, you know, there's even a couple in this very set that are like, if you attack with this and you do a little dance and it's mm -hmm. raining, this happens. And so I have no desire to do that. I do not want to attack with my Pashalik Mons deck. What I'm really looking for are kind of goblins in a can. I want things like Beetleback Chief, Siege Gang Commander. Um, and that's pretty rare. We, we get more combat goblins than anything else. But we did get one little gem uh, that I'm very, very excited about. My number five is Swarming Goblins. Uh, so Swarming Goblins is four colorless and a red. It's a creature type goblin with four power, three toughness. A lot of four threes in this set. Not really mm -hmm. sure what that's about. Mm -hmm. um, so a bit meatier for a goblin, which is fine. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you roll a d20. If you roll a one through nine, uh, this comes with a one, one red goblin creature. If you roll a 10 through 19, you get two 1-1 one, one goblins. And if you hit the big one, if you roll 20, you get three 1-1 one, one goblins. This is exactly what I was looking for. And so um, I can't wait to copy this with Kiki Jiki. I can't wait to pot into this with Pyre of Heroes. Um, I just love this. Yeah, this card is is certainly real and limited. I've played with yeah. it and against it, and it can run you over out of nowhere <laughs> and make a giant mess of goblins because they hit the 20 and oh God. And that's kind of where it goes from there. Yeah. yeah, surprisingly, even just getting one extra body out of this is surprisingly relevant. I mean, mm -hmm. venturing into the dungeon supplies you with a one red, one red goblin out of any other deck uh, a good amount of the time. And so being able to play this down on turn five, have a huge board presence that goes wide and tall. I mean, four power is going to be the biggest thing on the board most of the time. Right. Uh, but then also getting additional bodies off to the side. It's a very good common. I'm, I'm always happy to have this in my limited decks. So what we have here, what we have here is the best setup for my number five I could possibly have asked for. Oh. Because you have Ruben with one of his favorite man lands. And you have Aaron. One of her favorite goblins. And ah. you take the chocolate oh. and you take the peanut butter and you make Den of the Bugbear, which is my number five because this card is dope. If you have yet to play with it, it is the truth. And you will see a lot of it over the next year or two. Den of the Bugbear is a rare land that says if you control two or more other lands, Den of the Bugbear enters the battlefield tapped. You tap to add a red mana or for a red and three generic mana. So that's four total until end of turn. It becomes a three, two red goblin creature with quote, whenever this creature attacks, create a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token that's tapped and attacking and it's still a land so for that four mana you get two attackers one that's going to stay on the battlefield you can do whatever you want with it there's yeah. another one that's a three two so that's four power over your four mana and please wrath me because my den of the bugbear is just aching to come and get you that's how it works this card is sweet yeah, card's great. Um, I mean, creature lands are are spectacularly good. Like, like that's just yeah. full stop. This one creates a board presence, which I'm not sure we've ever had mm -hmm. a creature land that also creates a Tokens. token right. that's attacking along with it. Don't think um, so. Really coming through with the flavor of being a bugbear, which are the uber aggressive mayhem battle um like bullies of the goblinoids uh mm. and we finally get the word bugbear on a magic card which i think is great I, I will take the word bugbear on a magic card because it looks so cool and again that module version is absolutely terrific and i love it let's move on here to our number four ruben what's number four so they did a lot of cool things with card names in this set, hearkening back to, you know, I'm a huge, like, grognard. I'm like an old D&D, <laughs> old hat. And so I recognize a lot of the references. And so they named a couple things after spells and abilities and other things. And what they did was they named a creature after a spell called Guardian of Faith. Hmm. That was really an interesting translation of what the spell Guardian of Faith does. And oh, by the way, Guardian of Faith is just a crazy powerful magic card. Mm -hmm. Like, it has been a blowout every time it's been cast. Mm -hmm. Guardian of Faith is a colorless white-white for a 3-2 with Flash and Vigilance. Already, we're 
Doing good. Doing okay. When Guardian of Faith enters the battlefield, any number of other target creatures you control phase out. Treat them and anything attached to them as though they don't exist until the controller's next turn. And it's a spirit knight. So we can run it in our Collected Com- Coco Bant Spirits decks. Nice. This card counters a removal spell every time it's cast and then leaves behind an aggressive creature that can do double duty because it has vigilance. This card's really good. Yeah, I remember when this card was first previewed, I think they left off like the last part. And so people were like, do they come back? Like we didn't know what to make of this card. And then they revealed the whole thing and they were like, yes, it does. And so, yeah, this is really great to me. This is a take on kind of like selfless spirit, um, except you don't actually have to sacrifice it. Um, the fact that it's not indestructible is very relevant. Um, it's like a fairy's protection on a body, a very relevant creature type. Spirits has been a thing in Pioneer and Modern for a while. Um, yeah, this is fantastic and beautiful art on top of it. Yeah, I mean, we're already at four plus dollars a copy at this point. So it it, it stops a lot of problems. You know, that's a nice, nice Wrath of God you got there. I'll trade my 3-2 for every other creature that I yeah. have. It's going to get you next turn. Uh, and those are those are sweet stats. I might pick this up for Gaudy Turtle Alcatra because it would just be nice to have some nice in, insurance. There you yeah. go. Yeah. They try to source to plush air your guard, God Eternal. You flash this in, get a 4 4 and protect it. It's well, the good. God Eternal deck also has a lot of tokens, and so you don't want to do anything that'll make you lose your tokens. Mm. And so you can That's phase fair. them out, mm. and you still get to keep everything. So. Do they phase back? Do tokens yeah. phase back? They do. Here? They do. Wow. Yeah. They used to not. I learned they used that to not. Different. I learned that the other day because somebody played out of time against me mm-hmm. uh, in Commander, and I was able to destroy the out of time, and they were like, nope, do you? yeah. So cool. Yeah, there used to be a time where the the tokens would go away, and there was right. a batter skull the question. Old batter skull and, vision charm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that don't happen no more. Thanks. Okay, good. I'm glad they fixed that. Mm. Yeah, this is some, that's some old man magic for you right there. Mm-hmm. Hey, y'all remember when we used to stack damage and tokens would phase <laughs> oh, out and stuff? God. It was remember crazy. Patches. Look vision charm, kids. Remember Mana yeah. Burn, ladies and gentlemen? Oof. Oh, Mana Keepers. Burn. Barf. Aaron, what's number four? My number four is a card that has received comparisons to Grizzlebrand, uh, which of course means that I'm listening. Um, you know, when you think back on when Magic first started and the sort of satanic panic and, you know, how controversial it was to sort of have devils and have satanic imagery. And now we have a devil god. I mean, look how far we've come. Uh, my number four is Asmodeus the Archfiend. Mm. Um, so Asmodeus is four colors this in two black he is a legendary creature devil god with six power and six toughness and he has binding contract which means if you would draw a card you exile the top card of your library face down instead sounds a lot like necropotence to me um you can pay three black to draw seven so those seven are getting exiled and then you pay one black and return everything you exiled with asmodeus to your hand and you lose that much life and so this is amazing grizzlebrand is famously banned in commander um i love the outfit on this i love that the, the 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 creature types devil god um this is i'm thinking about putting this in my Raxos the showstopper deck because he's immune to the coin flips um and just i have whip of erebos i'm probably gonna get that life back and so um this card looks delicious like i just want to break this in half this is a a six mana six six (laughs) devil god (laughs) to this day you could probably get in trouble in an East Tennessee <laughs> school having a 666 <laughs> devil Evan. god in right. your binder. What is in your trapper Magic keeper, young man? Magic the the devil, Evan. It's principal Magic time. Magic the devil. You better go explain yourself, devil god. Has Jesus talked to you about Asmodeus? Because we need to know. This mm. is a super cool card, though. This is. Yeah. I'm glad we're here. We're here <laughs> The yes, there's no way in a million years this would exist in 1997 or whatever, but it's okay, it can exist today, and it's great that it can. Rock me, Asmodeus. Yes, Asmodeus is a uh, extremely good uh, strategist, uh, mm. and orator. He is known for giving impassioned speeches. He defended himself at the trial of Asmodeus in front of the celestial jury. Um, In addition to being swole AF, um, he is is a super smart tactician. uh, And he rules Nezus, the lowest of the nine hells. Um, And you don't get to that position. You don't get all the way to the bottom by not being good at your job. Look, there were... (laughs) I'm just Don't saying. Don't I know it? There was a point in the '90s when my mom, like, legitimately, seriously asked me if the game had anything to do with Satanism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's a thing that happened. I'm sorry it did, but there we yeah. were. 
Cheap plug here. Uh, if you want to know more about this topic, go look up Season of the Witch by our friend Ristic Studies. Mm -hmm. uh, he talks a little bit about this, and there's some narrating from yours truly. So there go, you go, go. go look, there see. You go. Perfect. Well, pluggy plugs. All right. Well, this is uh, my number four here is one of the best cards in the set. I've gotten to play with it. I've seen it in play. I've seen Deckless with it already. Uh, this is definitely the truth. Whenever you see a green card that says draw cards on it, you got to pay attention, particularly when it's rare, particularly when they push the stats. Werewolf Pack Leader is my number four. It's two green mana for a 3-3. Three, three. So let's back this up. Two green mana for a 3-3. Mm -hmm. three, three. That's our starting point. Fantastic. For a rare human werewolf with pack tactics, which means whenever it attacks, if you attack with creatures with greater, I'm sorry, with total power six or greater this combat, draw a card. Well, it's just a 3-3. Three, three. We got to fix that. Well, for a green and three generic mana colon until end of turn, it has base power and toughness 5-3 gains trample and isn't a human so you power it up before you attack you attack with six total you're drawing cards you're smashing faces it's all you want to do in the green deck that's how it works i love the art of this you know really leaning to almost the lycanthropy of it you have the bottom half which appears to be the legs of a woman right. um, you see this beautiful robe this beautiful dress very purple very feminine um and you have what's very clearly a wolf on top of that with the the, the the glowing eyes you see the giant moon behind you you see the wolves that are kind of skulking up behind them um you know really leaning into the different hues of purple like and it plays really well with the green frame as well like the purples mm. and the greens just look fantastic together yeah, look at this card, it's fantastic. This card is ludicrously pushed. I mean, we're starting with Kylonian Tusker, mm -hmm. which when they printed that in, what was it, M18, people were like, you can't just print a vanilla 3-3 three, three for green, green. Like, can't that's, that. you can't, you can't just do that. Uh, and then, you know, we've seen two mana 3-3s three, be popular and constructed from Fleece Main Lion to Watch Wolf. I mean, even Lamholt Pacifist saw play. Sure. Much less something that lets you draw cards and pump itself. I mean, yeah. this thing is just pushed just ludicrously in a number of different directions. Not shocking that it's already making waves in standard. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this is real because two of them play off each other with pack tactics perfectly. One of them powers up literally all you need is a 1-1 one, one or 1 power thing next to it in order to start drawing cards with it. I mean, and even then, sometimes you're just like, I guess I'm going to pay four mana and take out 25% of your life total. Go. I mean, that's the thing you can still do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, card is sweet. Let's move on here to number three. Ruben, what's number three? Listen, we couldn't get too far without <laughs> me loving on aggressive red cards. And uh, Aaron, listen, you've got a Pashlik Mons deck. Any Goblin Lord will take. This is an interesting take <laughs> on a Goblin Lord. Hobgoblin Bandit Lord yeah. is my is my Ooh, uh, my next pick. Colorless yeah. Red Red for a 2-3 creature Goblin Rogue. Other Goblins get plus one, plus one. So it's already not getting shocked, which is kind of great kind for of great. a Goblin Lord because we usually get Pyroclasmed out of the game. But it also has pay a red and tap colon. Hobgoblin Bandit Lord deals damage equal to the number of goblins that entered the battlefield under your control this turn to any target. That's a really interesting application of that ability. Mm. Real easy to make goblin tokens in all manner of formats, much less something like Muxus. Cranko uh, in historic. Just Cranko, exactly. <laughs> um, and Hobgoblin Bandit Lord, just a very cool card. I'm a big fan. And it's a sweet card, particularly in the limited uh, format where you're making goblin tokens like crazy. They're popping out everywhere for just one extra mana. You're able to deal direct damage to stuff, to people's faces, to their creatures, which is great. Uh, it's funny to me. There are four hobgoblins in magic. There's a rise of the hobgoblins, which is enchantment, but there's four hobgoblins, a two, two, a three, one, a one, two. And here we have a two, three. So the one that's going to survive shock, that's going to survive mm -hmm. ideally the longest and do the coolest stuff. And it pumps all of your other goblins. It's a Lord. Yeah. Like that card's ability is sweet. Yeah, to any target is very, very relevant. And sometimes yeah. you do run into awkward games. You have board stalls where the goblins just can't really punch through. And so um, this gives you the ability to kind of break that board stall where you can still deploy your creatures. They may not get through, but eventually you'll you'll break through and, and do what you need to do. All right. Aaron, what's number three? 
Uh, but number three is another card I'm considering for my Rakdos the Showstopper deck. Uh, for a while there, it felt like we didn't have very many good demons, where a lot of the demons out there were just very expensive. They just kind of did one thing very well. And I love that over the last few years, we've had a wide range of demons and devils of different CMCs that give you different effects. And so I'm really anxious to get my hands on this and see if it's any good. I love the art. Uh, this is Orcus, Prince of Undeath. Um, so Orcus is X, two colorless, a black and a red, a legendary creature demon with five power three toughness and flample it's flying and trample when orcus enters the battlefield you choose one each other creature gets minus x minus x until end of turn you lose x life um sure i'll take a board wipe that's fine okay. um or you can also return up to x target creature cards with total mana value x or less from your graveyard to the battlefield and they gain haste until end of turn so um this is either ending the game or this is giving you um a breather when you know things are really aggressive and you can't get out of them um i love this and i love the different hues of the black and the red that we're seeing here um it, there's like a faded red and some bold red reds and a muted red i love the body type i love that he appears to be almost jumping or like kind of mm. coming at you i love the horns i love the i just love everything about this card it's beautiful i mean the, the fact that it, you know essentially if you're at parody it's amazing if you're behind it's amazing mm -hmm. because you can sweep the board and save yourself or you can create the army that's going to rule over the board that's that's awesome i can't yeah, or just make this. a four mana five three flying tramp yeah you don't like, even have to do the silly stuff yeah, yeah, cards so just good. just good at all points of the game. Uh, Orcus, another legendary figure in the underworld. Uh, this one, of course, uh, on the opposite side of the Blood War, fighting against Asmodeus. Uh, you know, being a being a demon and all. Um, and another very classic D and D character. Um, you know, he he rewards evil people in undeath by adding them to his legions and you know, marching on the nine hells and stuff. Yeah. So for my number three here, this is a card that like, I'm, I'm waiting for the shoe to drop this to me. This card is way too good not to be in a deck. I don't know where it's at yet. If it's a, if it's a monocolor deck or if it's some weird combination of trying to dump stuff in graveyards, who knows? But when I first read this card, I was like, are you serious? I was like, look, man, I like the mythic dragons. Mythic dragons are cool. I like that. I was like, oh, the white one's cool. The white one feels pushed. That feels neat. And the green one, it makes treasure tokens, whatever. And I was like, holy God, the black one does what? This is a, <laughs> this is a what? A who? Ebon Death Draco Lich is two black, two generic mana for a 5-2 oh. mythic legendary zombie dragon with flash and flying. It enters the battlefield tap, but that doesn't matter because you may cast Ebon Death Draco Lich from your graveyard if a creature not named Ebon Death Draco Lich died this turn. This is the card that requires you to care about a graveyard in some form or fashion, or it's a 5-2 evasive card that will destroy your world. Like, I just that's how it is. Card's great. I, I like mean, it this. comes back. It it it's just it's like the perfect control finisher. Yeah, I hope you got some good exiling because that thing is just coming to get you over and over and over. Yeah, Oof. this is like the control finisher you want against an aggro deck, right? Mm -hmm. Because you want your opponents to have lots of creatures, so that when they shock your Ebon Death, then you're like, all right, heartless act, you're idiot, bring back my Ebon Death. Yeah, I mean, this card. This I would be shocked if this card didn't end up seeing some amount of play. Yeah, this this is uh, this is quite quite an interesting card, and I hope it gets there. I guess we shall see. Let's move on here to number two, my higher on my oh. list, but it's oh, wow. amazing card, so I'm okay with that. Ruben, what's number two? My number two is a legendary artifact that is uh, has has many stories told about it. It is the definitive treatise on all that's good in the multiverse. Many prominent figures are detailed in it, and several prominent figures have read the scripture of it. Um, legend has it that it can't actually be destroyed, which is what the ability of the Book of the Exalted Deeds does to you. Mm. The Book of the Exalted Deeds is a white, white, white legendary artifact. At the beginning of your end step, if you gain three or more life this turn, you make a 3-3 three, three white angel creature token with flying. And it has white, 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 tap, exile the Book of Exalted Deeds. Put an enlightened counter on target angel. It gains, you can't lose the game, and your opponents can't win the game. Activate only as a sorcery. It's like build your own platinum angel. That's right. Build your own platinum angel. And usually, you can put it on a faceless haven. Why does that exist in standard? In Why? standard. Exactly right. Is no. People are playing planes, 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 Book of Exalted Deed. 
just control elements, gaining some life to make some three threes to chump block, and Bob's your uncle. You can't ever lose. <laughs> I mean, you gotta be playing Field of Ruin. You have to draw the Field of Ruin before you do anything else. Like, it's just silly. I don't get it. This is one of those weird cards of, like, it It just, like, it sounds like a bunch of weird abilities that they may not have thought were even that good in a constructed environment because it does such weird stuff, but then Faceless Haven's like, yo, dog, did you forget that mm-hmm. I exist? Well, we only <laughs> get that combo for a couple of months, right? Like, I we're only so. going to have to yeah. deal with that for, you know, six months or so. Are you yeah. sure about that? that? I don't know. Call, maybe. Kaldheim's in the, I'm pretty sure Kaldheim's in the new standard. For like six months. Yeah. But it's also something you can deal with. It's got, you've got Field of Ruin. You've got the Trickster God's Heist is the answer that I've been seeing that Rogues Mm -hmm. has been starting to to use. Um, But it's, it's, I think it's just a cool, flavorful card, even if you didn't have the uh, Faceless Haven combo. Oh, yeah. I mean, it it certainly is neat. Don't get me wrong. I like the card. It's cool, you know. But weird combos that kind of break things are just weird combos that kind of break things for me. Yeah. It's fine. Aaron, what's number two? I love my number two. As I've said before, uh, I, I'm really in love with my Ozgear deck, which is red, white artifacts. I've had a Sharoom deck for what feels like forever. Um, and the fact that I can now have an artifact birthing pod, I'm completely here for this. Uh, my number two is Oswald Fiddlebender. Um, so Oswald is one colorless and a white. He's a legendary creature, gnome artificier, uh, two power, two toughness with magical tinkering. Uh, for one colorless and a tap, you can sacrifice an artifact. Search your library for an artifact card with mana value equal to one plus the sacrifice artifacts mana value put it onto the battlefield and shuffle and you activate only as a sorcery um yeah <laughs> um i would love to sacrifice my icker wellspring and go get a three drop sounds mm-hmm. good i would love to do this um i look forward to going up the chain i look forward to building my deck a certain way um i have at least two commander decks that can use this i'm, I'm a huge fan i'm ready for this also could be a commander deck in and of itself. I mean, Absolutely. this is a, this is a birthing pod. Yep. So, oh, yeah. uh, and not only that, but it's a birthing pod for a card type that I don't think we've ever had a birthing pod for before. Yeah. Um, I don't know how good a mono white artifacts commander deck would be, but uh, you know what? If anything could make it work, magical tinkering might be able to do the trick. Yeah. I mean, turns out this is the only Oswald in all of magic. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> also the only fiddle bender, but you know, who's counting? Uh, sure. This card is sweet. This is <laughs> this to me feels like, you know what? If it's a really cool, interesting ability and we stick it on a bear, it's fine. Because bears die. Two twos for two will die, and it's okay. You'll pay four mana for the tax later. That's okay too. It has to survive a whole turn around the table. And then, you know, and then maybe you get to use your cool ability and we'll do some fun stuff with it. And that's nice. All right. Let's move on here to our number one. Ruben, what's your number one? My number one is a card that Kind of, I don't know. I don't want to say it snuck up on me, but it did. It when I read it, I was like, that's clearly good, mm-hmm. but I didn't realize how good Ranger class was. Right. Oh, until right. I played it and was just like, it, pl- I mean, it reads good, but oh, yeah. it plays incredible. Ranger class is a colorless and a green for an enchantment class. When it enters the battlefield, you make a 2 2 wolf creature token for two mana, you go to level two. Whenever you attack, you put a plus one, plus one counter on target attacking creature. And then at four mana for level three, you may look at the top card of your library anytime. You may cast creature spells from the top of your library. So, I mean, it just creates a board presence, right? Anytime a permanent comes down early and makes two permanents, it's a big deal. And Ranger class does that. In addition, if you have nothing else that you can do, you can at least be attacking with a 3-3 your next turn. And oh, by the way, it's a card advantage engine in mono green late in the game to be able to get other creatures out of your deck. Yeah, this was my number two because Lord God, this card is just, it's just better than like everything else. My number one is because I like nerdy, weird, silly cards, but like, (laughs) like in reality, in terms of if this was the constructed list, this is on top. The, if you look at all the other classes, a lot of them add up to 10 mana. This one's eight mana and it's Mm -hmm. over those couple turns and the untap now, literally every attack step from here on out, I'm start putting counters on stuff. When I draw extra ranger classes, I I love it. Now, some of the yeah. other class cards are okay in multiples. This one is just the sickest. Like, please give me the two twos. Let me start putting counters on. I'm going to do the rest of the game. Like, if anything is going to push enchantment removal into main decks, 
I think it's Ranger class. Uh, this is the card I think I've seen Twitter talking about the most. I've seen so many people talking about blowouts. I've seen people talking about how, you know, they love this card, how they're sad they didn't pick this card, their experience is facing this card. Um, yeah, this was not a card I was expecting to see so much feedback on. And it's it's the card, at least of the people I'm following, that everybody's talking about. It is and truth. with how much um, uh, guff, we'll call it, that rangers have gotten in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. It's <laughs> nice to see that rangers are the best thing that you can be doing in Magic the Gathering. There you go. <laughs> justice for rangers. That's right. Justice for rangers. Aaron, what's number one? So this card may not look exciting when you compare it to everything else. And this is not a card that you would probably think I would be excited about or that I would rank as number one. Um, but I am so excited for this card. Um, this was a card that the minute I saw it, I was like, do you realize what this does? And um, and that's weird because I'm not normally excited about red cards, um, but I cannot wait to use this. Um, this is also a really great example of the you do something cards where, um, you know, you get the feeling like you're being told a story by your GM and you get to make some choices. I love the art. I love what it does. My number one is you find some prisoners. Um, mm -hmm. So you find some prisoners is one colorless and a red. It's an instant. It's an instant. Let me get there. Um, and you choose one. You can either break their chains, which means you destroy an artifact for two mana in red instant, which alone has seen play. Like we, we've all played a shatter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, if that's not your jam, you can also interrogate them. Um, exile the top three cards of target Target opponent's library, choose one of them. Until the end of your next turn, you may play that card and you may spend mana as though or mana of any other color to cast this. So this is effectively like a draw three in red at instant speed that also has a shatter attached to it. Like, what? <laughs> Um, you know, there's a lot of times there's scrying effects or there's people putting things on top of their libraries. You can sort of screw that up as well. Um, a lot of card advantage cards in red usually involve either discarding something or exiling your own stuff. Um, and this is exiling as well. So if an opponent happens to be playing yeah. a graveyard deck, they're not gaining the benefits of this. Um, I love this. I feel like this has a lot of potential. Um, all of this at instant speed? Like, what? Like, oh my yeah. god. And this card does seem like it could have a home specifically in Vintage because destroying artifacts is huge uh, and then messing with the top of libraries is huge. I mean, there aren't a ton of, you know, things that you really care about manipulating the tops of libraries in the younger formats, right. but you've got top, you've got Academy Ruins, Brainstorm. you've got a, a t I'm sorry? Brainstorm. 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 You've got, yeah, you've got a ton of yeah. crazy stuff that you can be doing in those older formats. The failsafe of mess with the top of their library and play one of their cards is really good. And oh, by the way, it's till the end of your next turn. Yep. So you get to just steal stuff out of their deck like you're playing Night Vale Spectre, or you can destroy their artifact. Yep. I think this card's great. And also, we didn't have a ton of the uh, choose your own adventure uh, cards in our list. And... I love this idea of the flavor words, break their chains or interrogate them. I think that, yeah. that that's such a cool idea. Yeah. In terms of like, you know, time capsule, <clears throat> someone's listening to this, you know, from 2025 or something like flavor words were absolutely incredible. Everyone loved them. They were an incredible boon to the set. If nothing, if literally nothing else was able to say, this is a core set, but it's not a core set. It's because they put flavor words on everything. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it bounces creatures, but it also, it flavorfully bounces those creatures. That's right. All right. So my number one here <clears throat> is ridiculous. It's Ruben's number eight by Power That's right. Elimination. I don't care. This is my number one because I was like, you know what? What's, what's the card that brings me the most joy out of this set? I like playing competitively great Ranger class number two. Cool. So werewolf pack leaders up there too. That's great. Okay, that's freaking great. But you can't tell me. You just cannot tell me that you're going to play a legendary creature that's going to make a legendary hamster, and that's oh. not just the most incredible <laughs> damn thing you ever heard in your life. Minsk, beloved ranger, is a white, green, and a red for a 3-3 three, three mythic legendary human ranger that says when it enters the battlefield, you create boo. It creates boo. Boo! <laughs> Boo! A legendary 1-1 one, one red hamster creature token with trample and haste, and it also has X generic mana colon until end of turn target creature you control has base power and toughness XX and becomes a giant in addition to its other types. Activate only as a sorcery. Boo! Go for the eyes. Gotta go. <laughs> go for it. Boo! 
Go for the eyes! Go yeah. for the eyes! Minsk and Boo are very indelible characters in the history of Baldur's <laughs> Gate. There is a large statue of Minsk and Boo, nine feet tall and broad in the shoulders, in the wide, which is a northern <laughs> district of Baldur's Gate, uh, depicting the beloved ranger is the name of the statue, and it, of course, is depicting Minsk, who is just a happy-go-lucky warrior adventurer who has a miniature giant space hamster. (laughs) Although there's no proof anywhere that it's anything other than a hamster. Um, But giant space hamsters do exist in in, um, Spelljammer. As they should. As they should. And and Boo might (laughs) might well be a miniature giant space hamster. Yeah, this showed up late in the set. I believe this being one of the last previews we saw. And Twitter, Mm. just social media just fell in love with this card of like, are you serious? And um, the fact that this is an actual factual character that has a card that this is actual canon. um, And just it's adorable and it's perfect. And just I would die for Boo. It's great. Yep. I mean, quote go for the eyes boo is on the token it's the flavor text on the token you know how un, you know like how rare it is to have flavor text on a token oh like my God. oh it fires on all of the cylinders and oh by the way this is four power and four toughness on a th- on a three mana card mm-hmm. yeah. like this is a tough this is this could get there i'm seeing um, it in lists there are nihilists sure. that exist with this card that's I right there it. Now, that said, that was our top 10 D&D cards. You'll see them on screen right now for your review. Take a look at my list, Aaron's list, Ruben's top 10. And we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about. And we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift to CoolStuffInc.com. But before we go, I want to thank my co-host. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ruben. Go for the eyes! <laughs> That's right. We'll move here to our final slide. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffing.com, our co-sponsors, CardHorder.com, AlterSleeves.com, and of course, Cuba Majigs, my co-hosts, Aaron Campbell and Ruben Pressler. You guys for watching and listening. I hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv at Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, our Magic Mics subreddit, and like the Magic Mics page on Facebook. Or join us here next week, same time, same place, for another episode of Magic Mics. Good night, everybody.